أعوذ بالله السميع العليم من الشيطان اللعين الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله الطيبين الطاهرين المعصومين الذين أذهب الله عنهم الرجس وطهرهم تطهيرا اللهم صل وسلم وزد وبارك على صحب الدعوة النبوية والصولة الحيدرية والعصمة الفاطمية والحلم الحسنية والشجاعة الحسينية والعبادة السجادية والمآثر الباقرية والآثار الجعفرية والعلوم الكاظمية والحجج الرضوية والجود التقوية والنقاوة النقوية والهيبة العسكرية والغيبة الإلهية اللهم عجل فرجه وسهل مخرجه واجعلنا من شيعتي وعواني وانصاره اللهم صل على محمد وآل محمد Today is the second class devoted to the Kitab al-Shifa, the healing or the cure of Ibn Sina. We will try and deal with one fossil in each class. As I said before, there are a total of um, 61 fossils or 61 chapters or sections or parts spread over <clears throat> the 10 discourses or maqalas of the Kitab al-Shifa. The last time we dealt with the first chapter or section, and today we will deal with the second. Now, it's very important to recognize, to understand the significance of the work of Ibn Sina. Um, in general, in the area of metaphysics, in the area of philosophy, but in particular in the uh, reworking, the reconstituting, the recasting of the metaphysics with a capital M of Aristotle, you know, the book known as the Metaphysics by Aristotle. And in this regard, the word reception is used by one of the great Western scholars of the works of Ibn Sina, the Italian scholar Amos Bertolacci, who is a student of Dimitri Gutas, in his famous book, The Reception of Aristotle's Metaphysics, in Avicenna's Kitab al-Shifa, A Milestone of Western Metaphysical Thought. That's the subtitle, A Milestone. So let us then begin today's class with a consideration of Aristotle's metaphysics very briefly, and then perhaps you will understand better and better and better as this course progresses, why the work of Ibn Sina in his own metaphysics, the Ilahiyat from the Kitab al-Shifa, is seen as a milestone. All right? <clears throat> Now, what do we know about Aristotle's writings? Unfortunately, his writings as they have reached us are not the most readable ones. Indeed, the great um, scholar and exponent of the philosophy of Aristotle in the 20th century Mortimer J. Adler, author of probably the most surprising bestseller of the 20th century, <laughs> uh, namely Aristotle for Everybody, he remarked that directly encountering Aristotle, uh, Aristotle's writings was not the best way to, to study Aristotle. It was not the first, you know, for a beginner anyway, and that's why he wrote this book to sort of introduce 
the uh, teachings of Aristotle and make them more accessible. Now, the great exception here in the works of Aristotle is the Nicomachean Ethics, which is a very readable book. So it would seem that the other writings are perhaps notes. And it's even said that Aristotle also wrote dialogues like Plato did. But these dialogues are lost. Another document of Aristotle's which survives is the will of Aristotle. Um, and that's uh, also translated. It's available. Is that in his the complete works? Is that mentioned or it's not considered? I'm not work? sure if it's mentioned in the complete works. We can check. Here's the complete works. Um, is it in the complete works? Hmm, I don't see it here. Mm. Magna Moralia, Economics, Rhetoric, Alexander, Poetics, Constitutions, and Fragments. Maybe it's in Fragments. I don't know. Uh, but there is a book called um, The Cambridge Companion to Aristotle, mm. and it's mentioned there. Anyhow, so how did uh, these writings reach us if, if they are the forms of his, uh, you know, his notes? They reached us in a very haphazard way. Um, the best book <clears throat> dealing with the history and biography of Aristotle and the school which he established was written in Italian by someone named Carlo Natali and it was translated into English by D.S. Hutchinson as Aristotle, His Life and School. Aristotle, His Life and School, published by Princeton University Press in Princeton, New Jersey, copyright 2013. This is a very serious work. Um, it was very well received by the scholarly community. The back cover carries a blurb by the eminent Parsi scholar of Aristotle, Richard Sorabji of Wolfson College, Oxford University. So <clears throat> this book deals in great detail with the biography of Aristotle and the school which he established. And there's an important chapter on the writings of Aristotle and how they were compiled and put together. So what we call the, you know, the complete writings of Aristotle, or the Aristot Aristotle's, uh, uh, actually it wouldn't be the complete works as they are in the Princeton edition, which I, I just uh, looked at. But, um, you know, his major, his major works uh, were put together much later in the form that presumably we've we've got them today. So there is a chapter. It's the it's chapter three. <clears throat> and there's an interesting passage here of how uh, the works were transmitted. He says here, there is no available external documentation concerning the organization and activity of the school in the time of Aristotle. All we have is sources that come much later. And uh, this author has gone through these much later sources and compiled them, and they're all sort of haphazard and contradictory. So we are told, for example that um, Aristotle actually had quite an extensive library. <clears throat> and it uh, contained, you know, his own writings and must have been other writings as well. And after his death, these writings went to um, a disciple of his named Theophrastus. And from Theophrastus, they ultimately ended up in Alexandria and ended up in the great library of Alexandria 
and it was on the basis of whatever reached there that an edition was put together much later on the first century by someone named and and andronicus of rhodes and presumably that's the form in which we have them today presumably i don't know i'm not an expert on all of these uh issues of transmission and so forth but that's that's what happened and there are different versions also different manuscripts there's different critical editions of of all of his works including the book known as the metaphysics and that's supposedly where they the name comes from uh the name metaphysics comes from you know the organization of these writings that they didn't know what to do with there were a bunch of treatises here that Aristotle wrote, and they didn't know quite what, what to do with them and where to put them. And so they put them after the physics, metaphysics, meaning after physics. And there's another version of the story that says, well, they didn't know how to file them in the library. And so they filed them. I mean, they filed them under Aristotle, but they filed them after the shelf on of, of the that had the scrolls on physics. Wallahu alam, and Allah knows best, you know, exactly what happened here. But there are differences between these manuscripts as well as there there are different critical editions, and I'm not a scholar of, of ancient Greek, so I don't know how <clears throat> how many manuscripts and what what they're based on. But there's the famous critical edition of a guy named W. D. Ross, who's a very eminent scholar of uh, Aristotle from uh, well, yeah Oxford, and then there was uh, a German scholar named Jaeger. Uh, those are the two very well-known critical editions. And I think there's another, there's a third one by somebody, I don't know his full name, I've, I've, not, I've never actually seen it, I've seen the other two. I think his name is, yeah, his name is Christ, actually, C-H-R-I-S-T, that's how I've seen it written in in um, uh, another uh, secondary work. So that's for the metaphysics. Um, those three editions, which I just, you know, those, but those names are, are, are for the metaphysics. Um, so even now, you know, with these critical editions and the many translations, there are many English translations of, um, the metaphysics of Aristotle. Here's, here's the most recent one I've seen by someone named C.D.C. Reeve, translated with introduction and notes by C.D.C. Reeves. This is a new effort. There's a famous <clears throat> publishing house that publishes philosophy <clears throat> texts called Hackett Publishing. Hackett Publishing in Indianapolis, Indiana, and in Cambridge, UK. <clears throat> this came out in 2016. So they're bringing out a whole new translation and editions of, of uh, Aristotle in English. So my point is that even now, after all of these centuries, and despite all of the efforts at translation and the different critical editions, it hasn't made reading... Aristotle and his metaphysics any easier. Now there is a famous um, scholar of Aristotle named Lloyd Gerson. Actually, I shouldn't call him a scholar of Aristotle. He's a scholar of, of, of philosophy. He's a very famous philosopher. And he has written a book called Aristotle and Other Platonists. It was just here. What happened to it? <clears throat> Ah, thank you. <clears throat> so we don't want to get into the argument of this book. It has a very provocative title, Aristotle and Other Platonists. This is um, Ithaca and London, Cornell University Press, 2005. But he makes a very important and interesting remark on page 173 of this book. It's a remark on the lack of influence and difficulty of Aristotle's metaphysics <clears throat> in the centuries after it was written. And what he says here is worth quoting in full. So please bear with me. He says, this is on page 173, and in fact it's the opening paragraph of the sixth chapter of this book entitled Aristotle's Metaphysics. He says, if one were to undertake even a casual investigation of the reception of Aristotle's metaphysics in the ancient philosophical world, 
one would perhaps be surprised at how little influence that work appears to have had. That's a very interesting sentence. <clears throat> Indeed, one would be hard-pressed to point to anyone over a period of some 500 years who could be said to have had a passable understanding of it. Interesting. It is only beginning with the great commentator Alexander of Aphrodisius that serious study of metaphysics with a capital M, the book by Aristotle, can be dated. After Alexander, the study of that work, or more accurately, of that collection of logoi, or treatises that came to be known as ta meta ta fusica, which is the way of saying in Greek metaphysics, was largely in the hands of Neoplatonists. Mm. Porphyry. Now, Porphyry was a student of Plotinus. Incidentally, Lloyd Garrison is also a great scholar of Plotinus. Plotinus. If you prefer Neoplatonism, he in fact has a book on Plotinus. And the new translation of the Aeneids of Plotinus, um, either he edited, maybe he did it himself, or it's a joint work, actually. Yeah, it's a joint work. Um, so he says, Porphyry tells us in his life of Plotinus. Now, if you if you actually buy the Aeneids of Plotinus in the Harvard University Loeb Classical Library, the life of Plotinus is, is there in volume one. I think it's in seven, seven small volumes. Tells us in his life of Plotinus that his Aeneids are, quote, full of concealed Stoic and peripatetic doctrines, unquote. Peripatetic meaning, of course, Aristotelian. And that, quote, in particular, Aristotle's metaphysics is concentrated in them. End of quote. A measure of that concentration may be found in, some, in the some 150 direct references in Aeneids to that work as listed in the Index Fontium of the edition of Henry and Schweitzer. It's a famous edition of the Aeneids. That there are, in addition, countless indirect references is beyond doubt. After Plotinus and up until the Middle Ages, virtually all treatment of metaphysics, capital M, the book by Aristotle, whether through commentary or in doctrinal studies, belongs within the Neoplatonic tradition. Now, of course, he glosses over, he doesn't talk about Avicenna and so forth, that's not his subject. But that's a very interesting observation. Uh, so, there... The study of Aristotle in the ancient world was dominated by so-called Neoplatonists. I've said many times I don't like the term Neoplatonist. I, I think this is, this is a, a problematic term. It's just Platonism. They didn't call themselves Neoplatonists. They saw, them, they saw themselves as followers of Plato. But I think it's very interesting that this easily the most obscure uh, uh, thing, <clears throat> sorry, <laughs> easily the most obscure work written by Aristotle is studied by Platonists. So this points also to, I think, a kind of false opposition, which is uh, um, um, upheld by many scholars of Greek philosophy, the, the, and, by, and by this I have in mind the opposition, the, 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 what they claim was the opposition of Aristotle to Plato. You know, so if this guy is so against them, why do they bother, bother working on him? Did and they... that's really the argument of the book. That's why Garrison's book, from which I just quote, is called Aristotle and Other mm -hmm. Platonists. Anyway, please, go ahead. Did, did they in the Muslim <clears throat> world find this to be a source of opposition. No, and that's what, exactly what I was going to say next. Mm. So Garrison argues in his book, and this is not off the point, this is not a digression. <laughs> I want to emphasize this. He argues in his book <clears throat> that in the Platonic tradition, the people who were studying Aristotle, they always upheld <clears throat> what he calls uh, harmonization or the harmony between Plato and Aristotle. And the Muslims also, they didn't see any, any, any such thing. And there's a very famous book by Al-Farabi. Al-Farabi is very, very influential 
in terms of uh, um, of his of his impact on Ibn Sina. He has a book called um, Al Jamu Bain al Ra'y al Hakimain. You know, the unification or harmonization of the teachings or opinions or doctrines of the two sheikhs. The two sheikhs, of course, are Plato and Aristotle. Uh, and of the two of the two Hakims, if you excuse me. Not the Shaykhain al Hakimain, Ra'ya Hakimain of the two sages. So the Muslims also upheld a harmonization principle or hypothesis. Or, I mean, it really wasn't a hypothesis for them. They, that they, they believed it. Um, so the Aeneids, mm. the Aeneids are divided into six. The Aeneids of Plotinus are divided into six, six uh, um, parts. And Aeneids 4, 5, and you know, so 4, 5, and 6 were translated into the um, Arabic language. And they became known as the theology of Aristotle, the Athlugia of Arastu Talis or Barastu. And Western scholars and Orientalists love to point this out. There's, oh, look, this was translated, and you know, the Muslims didn't even understand that this wasn't Aristotle, and so on and so forth. Now there's a there's a book called The Principles of Epistemology in Islamic Philosophy by um Abdul Hariyazdi. Yeah. By Hari Yazdi, you know, and he so he's really the first, I think, Iranian scholar who was educated in all of these things in the Hausa and came to the West to study and got a degree, a PhD in philosophy and <clears throat> he, he was before uh Hussein Mudarrasi as well. Yeah, oh. he is. And um he writes somewhere in that book that this idea that there was the Muslims had this notion that this that this was an actual book by Aristotle is just wrong. And what they actually understood was that this upheld the views of Aristotle, you know, because the theology, what is theology? Theology is al ilmul ilahi, or at least as we'll come to later, it's identified. Uh, there is a theological dimension. You know, metaphysics is also called al ilahiyat or the divine science. There's a theological component. <clears throat> So what was meant was that these ideas were in conformity with what Aristotle also upheld. And this remark by Garrison is very interesting, that there are all of these references. He says there's at least 150 you know, references. So does that mean that Plotinus agreed with everything that Aristotle said? No. But there is a great deal in Aristotle which is in so-called in harmony. So the, the harmony, for, 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 for a person like Gerson, the harmony position or the harmony hypothesis, and he's arguing a hypothesis because he's going against the grain in Western scholarship, is that, a, that the harmony hypothesis doesn't mean that these so-called Neoplatonists agreed and upheld every single thing that Aristotle taught. <clears throat> anyway, I think this is an important point. I think that this, this idea is very important that, one, the metaphysics of Aristotle is pretty much not even looked at it seems anyway we can't find any direct source according to Garrison I'm quoting him I'm relying on him here for five centuries then you have um um what did he say Alexander Aphrodisius and uh, again <clears throat> that this was all within the tradition of so-called Neoplatonism then it passes into the Muslim world and people like Al-Farabi Al-Kindi they must have been influenced I mean um by 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 this reading um, and then, of course, we come to Avicenna or Ibn Sina and his reworking of this, of this text of Aristotle. Was someone going to say something here? Did you yes, want to add I was something? going to say that, would you consider that this whole division of the Masha'i school versus the Shiraki school and somebody like a contemporary Iranian scholar, Abdul Rasul Abudiyah, mm -hmm. when he describes these different schools, he says the Masha'i school is more Aristotelian in thought. Whereas the Ishraqi school is more Platonic in thought. Mm -hmm. Would you consider this as a modern day demarcation and a modern day division? Or? Well, what happened, I think, in Islamic philosophy was a little bit different. Because when you say the peripatetic school in Islam, that's really not Aristotle in, anymore. It's, it's Aristotle through the lens of Ibn Sina. Mm -hmm. And <clears throat> then when you say the Ishraqi school... It it's not really Platonism. It's yeah. it's Greek philosophy, Plato and other Greek thinkers and Iranian ancient Iranian thinkers through the lens of who? Through the lens of Shahabuddin Surawardi al-Maqtul. Mm -hmm. 
Okay. So there, there is a real opposition. If you take the, if you, if you, if you, you know, forget about Aristotle and Plato now, what, what's really at, at issue here is Ibn Sina, especially in his Isharat with Tanbihat and, and the Shifa, versus Shahabuddin Surah al Maktul in his book Hikmat al Ishraq and others, and other writings of his. And yes, those two figures look at things very differently. Mm-hmm. And then, of course, the next big turn in Islamic philosophy, of course, is Mullah Sadra. So yeah, and then before Mullah Sadra, there is, of course, and after Suhrawardi al Maktul, there's Muhyiddin ibn Arabi. And within that, you know, there's other people as well. Mir Damad, we don't talk a lot about him. And maybe they do in Iran. I don't know how, about the interest in, in Mir Damad in Iran. But obviously there are people interested in him here, in him there. Um, um, and people have written on him and, yeah, and all this. But, but he's also an important figure in his own right. Um, so there are, there are true dichotomies. There are true oppositions there. But they shouldn't be seen as as some had a cont- a continuation of the supposed opposition between Aristotle and Plato. So essentially, and they're more in opposition between Ibn Sina and Suhrawardi. Opposition between Ibn, Ibn Sina and Suhrawardi, and then when you come to Mullah Sadra, the whole supposed dichotomy between Asalatul Wujud and Asalatul Mahiya yeah. is it a re- you know th- that's also worthy of discussion. Is it really a huge difference? Is it terminological? What did Suhrawardi really say? These are all these are all important issues. They're not small questions. Uh, um, but on a certain level, there is something which we can call the kind of Islamic Platonism and a kind of Islamic Aristotelianism. Yeah. If you keep in mind that it's a reflection through these lenses of all of these names I just mentioned. So there's, including Muhyiddin ibn Arabi, there's a kind of refraction, reflection, whatever, you know, light passing through some sort of a Ibn Arabi lens. And we got into this recently. I don't know if you've had a chance to hear the recording of our class on Tajrid al-A'tiqad, where um, it was on, what was the topic again? Uh, There was the coextensiveness of being and thinghood and then after that there was the doctrine of the the repudiation of the doctrine of the intermediate ontological state and there ayatollah hassan hassan zadeh in his gloss seems to uphold not the theory of the intermediate ontological state as was upheld by by uh you know abu hashem al jubai and um al qadi al baqillani and uh, Abu al-Ma'ali al juwaini but he he's upholding what's really Ibn al-Arabi's doctrine of al-A'yan al-Thabita, yeah. or the fixed entities. So the doctrine of the fixed entities in Ibn al-Arabi is something like, I'm not saying it's the same, but it's very similar. Whether it's the same or not is something which needs to be investigated in detail uh, uh, as the Platonic ideas. Which I think in modern Arabic they call al muthul al aflatuniya, but you know Ibn Arabi talks about al ayyan al thabita, and you have a similar idea in Shahabdin Surah al Maktul. He talks about what's called arbabul anwa'a, and Mir Damad talks about this, this ontological domain, in the context of trying to solve the problem of al huduth wal qidam or whether the cosmos is originated in time or not. He has this famous book called Kitab al Qabasat where he advances a theory known as al Hudut al-Dahri. So he has a dimension called Dahr, which is supposedly like the dimension of the Platonic ideas. Mm-hmm. Wallahu alam. So this is a whole area that's worthy of, of, of investigation, but suffice it to say that you can find these kind of things, these kind of similarities and resonances with pl- pl- a Platonic teaching or an Aristotelian teaching, but then to say that that's exactly what it is without realizing that these things, these things have been reflected through a lens as I like to say, of whether it's Avicenna, Avicenna, Ibn Sina, or whether it's Suhrawardi, or whether it's Ibn Arabi, or whether it's Mir Damad, or whether it's Mullah Sadra. Yeah. All right, so that was a bit of a digression. All right, now let's rewind. Let's get back on track. So suffice it to say that the writings of Aristotle have reached us not in their best possible form, 
they were transmitted, as I said, and you can refer to Natal the Natalie's book on the whole transmission of Aristotle's library and his writings. Then we realized that, you know, these writings, uh, the writing known as the metaphysics or the treatises known as the metaphysics were, were according to Gerson, neglected for about 500 years. And uh, Alexander of Aphrodis, Aphrodis is the first sort of dateable person who, who, who comments on it. And then we, we, we come, you know, to its transmission in the Islamic world. Al-Farabi, um, Al-Kindi, first of all, had an acquaintance with the metaphysics of Aristotle. And he interpreted it in a more theological fashion. Theological in the sense that more recognizable as, as, as you know, some sort of kalam theology. Al-Farabi wrote a small treatise explaining that what was going on in each of the 14 um, books of the metaphysics of Aristotle. And um, Ibn Sina finally understood what he claims the metaphysics of Aristotle was about after he read that book. He claims to have read the metaphysics of Aristotle 40 times. Now, there's more than one translation. I think there's at least two translations of the metaphysics which were done into Arabic. And it's a question, you know, you know which exactly, which one did Ibn Sina read? And all of that is, is investigated in excruciating detail by Bertolacci in um, this book, The Reception, in part one. The Arabic Reception of the Metaphysics Before Avicenna. So he looks at all the Arabic translations. He looks at Al-Kindi, Al-Farabi, uh, lots of things. So that's all. Th those are all very important and profound and complex textual and historical questions which do not concern us. So, uh, so suffice it to say then that Ibn Sina, the doors, so to speak, are open as to, as to the meaning of the metaphysics through his study of Al-Farabi. So what exactly do we encounter when we go to the metaphysics of Aristotle. So there's 14 books, and it's a famously puzzling book. It's a famously puzzling text, as I've said, down to our own times. It's, it's a very intimidating book to read. It's very obscure. So there's 14 books. There's, and they have little Greek letters. Each book is named by is known by a Greek letter. So there's book alpha, there's book gamma, there's book this and that and the other thing. And so sometimes people refer to the metaphysics as the Kitab al Huruf as well in Arabic, mm -hmm. but it has nothing to do with you know ilm al Huruf or some kind of occult science. So in book alpha, so if you see it in English, they'll write it with a capital A, but you have to understand that's book alpha. In book alpha, metaphysics or wisdom is identified as the science of the first causes and principles. And then it, uh, Aristotle launches into an investigation of, of what his predecessors had to say about the four causes. Then after Book Alpha, there's a smaller book, which is not usually not counted as its own book. It's called Book Little Alpha, or Alpha El Laton. And it's interesting that in some of the Arabic translations, Book Big Alpha or Capital Alpha isn't there. Like in, in, or it comes later. You know, there's there's a difference in the arrangement. So, for example, in Ibn Rushd, Ibn Rushd's Tafsir or Greater Commentary on the Metaphysics of Aristotle, he begins with Book Little Alpha, and that's very interesting because that book Little Alpha approaches metaphysics as the knowledge of the principles of eternal things, and there's also an investigation of, of, of infinity and, and the impossibility of an infinite regress and things like this. Then in book beta, you have the discussion of 15 metaphysical problems. In Greek, they're called aporia. Aporia. Just means a problem. In book, after that, you get book gamma. Mm -hmm. So it's like alif, ba, jim. Is the, you know, the Greek alphabet is, apparently comes from a Semitic source, you know, via Phoenician. Mm -hmm. So book Gamma, in book Gamma, metaphysics is identified as al-falsafatul ula, or first philosophy, and as the science of being, qua being, mm -hmm. its properties, causes, and species. Then you have book Delta. 
bunch of different metaphysical terms. In fact, 30 different metaphysical terms are investigated in the book Delta. Then you have book Eta. Is it Eta or is it Epsilon? Look at Epsilon. Sounds more. I don't know the Greek alphabet. I'm looking at a capital E here. I don't know. Epsilon. Must be Epsilon. Yeah. Um, again, here, metaphysics is identified as first philosophy, but also as a discourse on the divine theology. It is Epsilon. It is Epsilon. Okay, then um, you have books Zeta, and then I think you have Eta. Mm -hmm. there, there's Z and H here, if you read them in yeah, English. Zeta and Eta. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> Are you reading some sort of Wikipedia page? No, no, I pulled up a chart. Okay, uh, all right. <laughs> <laughs> no Wikipedia allowed. Um, so Zeta and Eta are looking at substance, usia. Book Theta is al quwa wal fa'al, poten potency and act. Then book um, Iota, it must be. Yeah. I, unity and multiplicity. I and then book Kappa is a summary of the previous books. Then the 12th book is book Lambda, L. Lambda, yeah. yeah. This one in English, they don't write as an L. They look, they write like an A without a line through it, right? Um, so that's, again, substance. And then God is the unmoved mover. So it's similar to parts of the physics of Aristotle, where that's the main discourse. What pages are this, uh, break, is this breakdown on? And... This isn't actually... Uh, I mean, you can find this in a lot of places, but... For the purpose of studying Arist uh, the Avicenna, Bertolacci gives this at the first page of chapter 5. Uh, the page number is 149. Oh, you brought yours? Okay. Yeah. It's on 149. So then you have books, you know, 13 and 14 will be Mu and Nu, M and N. No, okay. And it's just a criticism of some Platonic doctrines, but that's sort of the 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 the, the way the book is set out. So all of the, the, the this material is reworked by Ibn Sina, and for our purposes today, we're really more concerned with uh, the places where metaphysics is de defined, because we we are still at the point in our investigation of the Kitab al Shifa of exactly what metaphysics is. Ibn Sina has not really explained what metaphysics is. And it's highly significant that he's doing this. <clears throat> Remember, this was something like, what, 1,200 years ago? Right. Uh, and so uh, no one has actually done this before. So the question of what the theme of what is known as metaphysics is, is raised and thoroughly discussed by Ibn Sina in the Ilahiyat of the Shifa for the first time in the history of philosophy. I hope you understand the significance of what I just said. It's very important. So what we are looking at in the first four fossils of al maqalatul ula which consists, I think, a total of eight, but in the first four, he's just trying to figure out what metaphysics is. So we've got metaphysics as wisdom, metaphysics as the science of first causes and principles, metaphysics as first philosophy, metaphysics as the divine science, or if you prefer theology, metaphysics as the subject which seeks or searches after God and the ultimate causes, but for which those are not the subject matter. That was the sort of the, the conclusion of our first, first lecture. So what Ibn Sina actually does in the first maqala, it's just a quick summary, he succeeds in unifying the views expressed by Aristotle himself in his metaphysics. In other words, that metaphysics is one, a science dealing with first causes and principles. Okay, so there's sort of three things he pulls off here. The first is that metaphysics is a science dealing with first causes and principles. Two, that it deals with being qua being. Three, that metaphysics deals with that which is separate or separable. Separable or separate here in the English translation means separable or separate from matter. And that it is motionless. Motionless means that it, it's there's no haraka. Remember, haraka is like a code word for change in general. They, in other words, it's they're motionless. They are changeless and eternal things. So metaphysics is concerned with 
that which is separate from matter, separable from matter, which does not undergo change and which is eternal. And what does it mean when it says it's concerned with first principles? The very first principles of things often have to do with causes. Because for Aristotle, you don't really know a thing unless you can define it. That's in logic. And then if you can know its cause. Mm -hmm. And for him, the causes, you know, we don't use them that, those four causes, we don't use the word cause in English like that. They're, if you prefer, modes of explanation. Mm -hmm. Like in English, material cause, formal cause, they don't really mean much. In modern English, to say that you know the form of these reading glasses is its cause, one of its causes mm -hmm. of four, doesn't mean it, that we don't use the term that way outside of philosophical discourse. So Ibn Sina then um, identifies on page thirteen of the Cairo edition, lines twelve to thirteen that metaphysics is an investigation of the existent qua existent. He says, page, th this is the Cairo edition, page 13, lines, yeah, 12 to 13. فَالْمَوْضُوعُ الْأَوَّلُ لِهَذَا الْعِلْمِ هُوَ الْمَوْجُودُ بِمَا هُوَ مَوْجُودُ You want me, yeah, um, let me find it in the other uh, it's al-faslu thani al-faslu thani fadahirun let's see maybe then check on page 17 I marked this one no I marked it like last time you marked it last time then why isn't it here <laughs> the metaphysics definition, right? The subject matter? I believe we, the thing is, we marked it in Al-Fasl al oh, here. This is book one, chapter two. This right here, maybe? Here it is. Yeah, there you are. See, I marked it right. You did. So it's on page 10 okay. of the Mar Michael Marmur translation. The primary subject matter of this science is hence the existent inasmuch as it is an existent. Right. And the things sought after in this science. Are those that accompany the existent in as much as it is an existent unconditionally. So here you are, page 10 of the Michael Marmura edition. All right, so. However, this mojud, this existent, considered in and of itself, considered in itself, <coughs> is independent from matter and motion, in other words, change, and implies the study, <coughs> excuse me, of first causes and principles as its ultimate aim. Ibn Sina also harmonizes the account of metaphysics as a science by Aristotle in his Metaphysics, capital M, with the epistemology of Aristotle's prior analytics. This is important. Aristotle has a book called The Prior Analytics. <clears throat> Thus, <clears throat> the existent qua existent, or al-mawjud bima huwa mawjud, is the subject matter of metaphysics, <clears throat> whereas the first causes and principles... Namely, God as the cause of causes and principle of principles are among the things searched for, the things sought after in metaphysics. The distinction between subject matter and things sought after comes from Aristotle's posterior analytics. <clears throat> I mentioned earlier Al-Farabi and Al-Kindi. So also in the first maqala, in, in, sorry, in the first chapter, the first fasl of the first maqala, Ibn Sina also incorporates and combines notions introduced by these two scholars, namely Al-Farabi and Al-Kindi, in his own way. Thus, Al-Farabi's emphasis on the ontological perspective of metaphysics, that's Al-Farabi, is combined with Al-Kindi's theological view of metaphysics, resulting in the existent qua existent, Al-Mawjud bima huwa mawjud, being taken as the subject matter of metaphysics and God and the ultimate causes as the thing sought after, as the goal. That is what was happening or what is happening in the first fasl of the first maqala. 
Now, <clears throat> if we go then to the second, <coughs> excuse me, the second maqala, the second fasl of the first maqala, excuse me, al maqala al ula al fasl al thani. Yeah, so you're gonna have to find your way in your book. You got it? Mm -hmm. Okay. So Ibn Sina here is also reworking the metaphysics of Aristotle. When I say metaphysics of Aristotle, it's capital M. It's the book by Aristotle. Here he reworks the structure of Aristotle's metaphysics. And he alludes to this reworking and that he's going to be doing this at the very beginning of the Shifa. So the very beginning of the Shifa, a different volume. It's when he's 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 setting out the book early on. He talks about what he's going to do. So this is in the Mantiq or the Madkhal of the Mantiq, you know, the intro part of the of the logic. So in the Cairo edition, it's in the Mantak volume 1, pages 9 to 10. So on page 9, it's actually line 17. I think that's the last line on the page. And then it goes over to page 10. So you have lines 1 through 7. So he says, وَلَا يُوجَدُ فِي كُتُبِ الْقُدَمَاءِ شَيْءٌ يُعْتَدُ بِهِ إِلَّا وَقَدْ ضَمَّنَّاهُ كتابنا هذا كتابنا هذا فإن لم يوجد في الموضع الجاري بإثباته فيه العادة وجد في موضع آخر رأيت أنه أليق به وقد أضفت إلى ذلك مما أدركته بفكري وحصلته بنظري وخصوصا في علم الطبيعة وما بعدها وفي علم المنطق وقد جرت العادة بأن تطول مباد المنطق بأشياء ليست منطقية وإنما هي للصناعة الحكمية أعني الفلسفة الأولى فتجنبت إيراد شيء من ذلك وإضاعة الزمان به وأخرته إلى موضعه Bertolacci translates this into English uh, on page 150 of the reception so we can just refer to that and read that back to you save ourselves um, there is nothing of account to be found in the books of the ancients. لا ولا يوجد في كتب القدماء شيء يعتد به which we did not include in this book of ours. If it is not found in the place where it is customary to record it, then it will be found in another place which I thought more appropriate for it. So when he's talking about Al-Qudama, he's obviously got in mind Aristotle. It is customary to prolong the discussion on the principles of logic with material that does not belong to logic, but only to the discipline of wisdom. as hikmiya by which he means metaphysics. I mean the first philosophy, Al-Falsafatul Ula. Therefore, I avoided mentioning any of that in logic and wasting thereby time and deferred it to its proper place. And this is true. There are things, you may remember when we were studying logic, that uh, come up in logic that are properly or strictly speaking metaphysical questions. And so Ibn Sina doesn't want to mix between the two. And so he makes it very, very clear at the very beginning of the whole Kitab al-Shifa that he's going to be reworking this stuff, reworking these, these materials and casting them in a different way. Okay? Now, this reworking by Ibn Sina is highly original, and it results in making metaphysics, small m, the queen of the sciences. Yeah. Ibn Sina works this out in detail in the second fossil of the first maqala. So here's an overview in just a couple of sentences of what he actually does. Just a second. Just a second? Okay. 
So what does he do? He begins by discussing sciences other than metaphysics. In other words, he discusses physics, mathematics, and logic. So the second one, if you have your English, you can follow along. I'm just going to read the Arabic, but you have the English, right? You open to the right page? Okay, he says, al fasl thani and again, we've been over this before. Some of these fusul headings and stuff, you know, they're not, they may not be in all of the manuscripts. But anyway, al fasl thani fasl fi tahsili mawdu'i hadha al-ilm. So much for the headings. He says, فَيَجِبُ أَن نَدُلَّ عَلَى الْمَوْضُوعِ الَّذِي لِهَذَا الْعِلْمِ لَا مَحَالَةَ حَتَّى يَتَبَيَّنْ حَتَّى يَتَبَيَّنَ لَنَا الْغَرَضِ الَّذِي هُوَ فِي هَذَا الْعِلْمِ فَنُقُول Okay, he's just getting into it now. Now he gets to the point. إِنَّ الْعِلْمَ الطَّبِيعِ He begins with physics. So he says that physics قَدْ كَانَ مَوْضُوعُهُ الْجِسْمِ What does that mean? You've got the English there. I don't have it in front of me. Yeah. So what does it say in the English? Somebody. The subject matter of natural science, as we have seen, was body. Was body. Al-jism. <clears throat> so physics, al-tabi'i, al studies bodies. Al-jism. وَلَمْ يَكُنْ مِنْ جِهَةِ مَا هُوَ مَوْجُودٌ And it doesn't study, I'm just going to paraphrase, it doesn't study <clears throat> al-ajsam, or bodies, from the point of view of their existence, and not from the point of view of whether it's a substance or not a substance, nor from the point of view or from the aspect of what it's composed of, in other words, of, of matter and form, hayula and surah, it has in Arabic. So it studies al ajsam or bodies from the aspect or from the point of view of motion and rest, from the point of view of change. Uh, what's the English for that? The sciences that fall under natural science are further away from this. Mm -hmm. The same is the case with the moral sciences. So they're further away from what? Of this. It says min dhalik. Or, sorry, uh, no, I, it's I, studying it from that... the point of view that they are mawjood. Okay. Yeah. So the sciences which come under al um, al al uh, <coughs> excuse me al ilm al tabi'i. And ilm al akhlaq has been called khuluqiyat often yep. as well. Well, I don't know if it's often, but it's clear what that it means yeah. ethics. Um. So. العلوم which are تحت العلم الطبيعي. So for example, medicine. علم الطب is considered to be one of the things which actually comes under physics or natural science. Um, أبعد من ذلك أبعد من ذلك أي من أن يكون البحث فيها من جهة الوجود. Yeah, in other words, just like I said, so these things are abad min dhalik. In other words, they're abad, they're even further, they're even they're even more remote. Mm -hmm. They're even more remote from being uh, the object of study from the point of view of that they exist than they are in physics proper. Or that whether they are a johar or not. Or whether they're a substance or not. Or in terms of their composition of matter and form. Okay? Um, وَكَذَلِكَ الْخُلُقِيَاتِ It's the same, you know, ethics, you know, we're, we're concerned with human action there. The, right. what, what is right action, practice of virtue, etc. So he begins then with a consideration of physics. Then he moves to a consideration of mathematics. وَأَمَّا الْعِلْمُ الرِّيَاضِي وَأَمَّا الْعِلْمُ الرِّيَاضِي so, al-riyadi studies quantity, al-kam. And quantity is of, a two, ki of two kinds, muttasil wa munfasil, continuous and discrete. Continuous quantity studies geometry, as well as astronomy, mathematical astronomy, al -hayya. And what was the geometry called among the Al-Hindasa. 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 Al yeah. I know geometria is a new... <laughs> geometria, yeah, but in, in Arabic it was Hindasa. Mm. Okay, and then Al-Munfasil or discrete quantity studies number 
And that is the topic of study in Al Hisab wal Musiqi. Is it Musiqi or Musiqa? In Urdu, we say Musiqi. I always get this one mixed up. I like Musiqi too. Anyhow. Right, so hisab or arithmetic, and then mu by music they mean the mathematical study of music. Okay. So he goes through that. He says, "فقد كان وأما العلم الرياضي فقد كان موضوعه إما مقدارا مجردا في ذهني عن المادة." موسيقي. موسيقي. So what's the what's the شو uh, what's the uh, what's the English for that? إما مقدارا مجردا في الذهن عن المادة. As for mathematical sciences, its subject was either measure abstracted in the mind from matter. Ah, so مقدار is measure. So that's al hindisa عن المادة. وإما مقدارا مأخوذا في الذهن مع مادة. Yeah. Or measure apprehended in the mind with matter. That's al hayya, which is also called al majasti, I think, or al majasta. You know, so the study of Ptolemy's Almagest. Okay, so the, the study the, of Ptolemy's Almagest is mathematical astronomy, ilm al hayya. So, imma miqdaran mujarradan fi dahna lil madza, that is going to be uh, geometry. Yeah, an al madza is geometry, yeah. And then ma al madza is astronomy, mathematical astronomy. Then, wa imma adadan mujarradan, or pure number abstracted from matter, that's al hisab, or al arithmetic, or arithmetic. وَإِمَّا عَدَدًا فِي مَادَّةٍ Or number in matter, that's music. So he's going through each of these sciences very carefully to show that none of them have anything to do with the study of al-mawjood bima huwa mawjood. So he goes through physics. He goes through mathematics. And um, he continues there. He says, وَلَمْ يَكُنْ أَيْضًا ذَلَكَ الْبَعْثِ مُتَّجِهًا Um... متجهاً إلى إثبات أنه مقدار مجرد أو في مادة. I gotta get to English here. In my own copy. What page is that on? Seven. 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 Okay, this investigation too was not directed toward establishing that it is either measure abstracted from matter or measure in matter or number abstracted from matter or number in matter, but it was in the direction of the states that occur to measure after being thus posited. So it's concerned with the study of miqdar or adad, right? Each time, measure or number, construed in various ways, but not in terms of whether measure or number and, uh, what, exists what, or not. What element differentiates miqdar from adad? Miqdar is a measure. Okay. And adad, they, they understood just as pure, as a, as a pure number. Uh, okay, pure abstract. Yeah, so it's a good question though. So if you, if you talk about geometry, then in geometry, you're looking at shape, right? You're looking at extension in space. You have a line, you have a figure, you have a surface, and they're subject to some kind of measurement. You know, they don't introduce any quantity. You can put a compass down and say it's this big. And you have a particular line segment, and you can copy that line segment. Or you can be given a line segment, and you can be... I just want to make sure. Uh, so you're given a line segment, for example, and then uh, you're asked to construct an equilateral triangle with that seg uh, with sides of that segment. And so that's what you're doing in geometry or you're, or you're proving that two triangles are congruent or you're proving that such and such a line is tangent to a circle. So you're dealing with a kind of quantity in the sense that's extension in space, but you are not combining them or adding them together like you do pure numbers. Do you understand? Mm -hmm. And in al hayya I'm not really sure how they actually... <laughs> You know, they're, they're talking about, uh, presumably, the locations, the locations, um, you know, the coordinates, you know, where is such and such heavenly body going to be on such and such date? What mm. sign is rising at such and such time, you know, and using your astrolabe, supposedly you can figure these things out. I don't know how to use an astrolabe. 
Whereas in al-hisab, you just have pure quantity. And that pure quantity, so you're adding two and five. But the two and five could be you have two apples added to five apples to get seven apples. And, and so you were five short of a dozen. Yeah, arithmetic. And then in music, they're looking at proportion. Of, for, so they they would often talk about, you know, it goes back to Pythagoras, you have some kind of a string and you pluck it a certain way and it vibrates a certain way. Uh, so so that's what they're talking about. So there you can talk about an actual pure number, whereas in the others you can talk about... Hmm. So I would say that the one is more geometric, that's all. Uh, Wallahu alam. Oh, because of the strings and the waves, that's why it says mm -hmm. than yeah. that element. Yeah. Okay, so then he turns to logic. How did he translate this here? The subject matter. Secondary intelligibles. Uh. So logic is the study of secondary intelligibles. Interestingly enough, this is also the definition which Nasir ibn Atusi favored in his book, Tajreed al Mantiq. Just like there's a Tajreed al Atiqad, there's a Tajreed al Mantiq. There's an epitome of logic, just as there's an epitome of doctrine. So he basically he goes through these sciences and he's trying he's driving at the conclusion that <clears throat> none of them studies the existent as existent. None of them studies that. So if you go further, he says Fabayinun. so turning to the English translation, uh, I must find this. I don't want to translate this all off the top of my head. So that's line five. That's page nine. It is thus evident that all these subjects fall under the science that is engaged with those things whose subsistence is not connected with um, things which can be understood by the senses. He says here, Marmur says sensibles. It was kind of awkward, I think. But anyway, we'll go with this translation. It is impossible to posit for them a common subject matter other than the existent of which they would all constitute the states and accidental circumstances for some for some of them are substances some are quantities and some are other categories categories being the is mm. you know the 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 the, the, the ten maqulas the ten categories no ascertainable meaning can be common to all of them other than the true meaning of existence haqiqatu ma'nal wujud very important. So Ibn Sina, he works all this out. He begins by discussing physics. Then he goes to mathematics, then logic. Then, we didn't read this part, he moves to a consideration of the notions of substance. You can read that. You can see he, he talks about Jawhar. Then he talks about bodies. Ajsam. Then he talks about measure, miqdar. Then number, adad. Mm -hmm. So as you can see, all of these have some connection with some of the, sci the sciences we've mentioned before. He then concludes that all of these notions fall under a science that is engaged with those things whose substance is not connected with that which can be perceived by the five senses. I prefer that to Marmur as sensibles. In other words, they can be perceived by the mind, by the aql. They are noetic. They have a noetic, noetic, di noetic dimension. And that it's impossible to posit for them a common subject matter other than the existent, al mojud So what unites all of these? What is common to all of these? What is common to the subject matter of physics, of, of logic, of um, uh, mathematics? 
it's the mawjud. The existent as uh, as existent. So Ibn Sina then drives home his conclusion even further in terms of what the topic, what the theme really is of metaphysics further on in the Cairo edition. Um, well, first he says, We already read this earlier. So the, the subject matter of this is of this science is the existent qua existent. So then on page 14 and 15, excuse me, 14 and 15 of the Kitab al-Shifa that he um, sets out his vision of metaphysics. And for him, metaphysics is in the f first and foremost an ontology, a science of being. It's an ontology of first causes, properties, and species of mawjud or existent. This is a threefold division of metaphysics, a threefold division in connection with the status of the existent, al mawjud as its subject matter. Let me say again. So in the vision of Ibn Sina, metaphysics is an ontology and it, it has a threefold division relative to the status of the mawjud or the existent as its subject matter. The first division or first part investigates the causes of the caused existent. al mawjudul ma'lul as well as the ultimate causes and the first cause. The ultimate causes, he, in Arabic, calls it asbab al-qusua. And these are the four modes of explanation in Aristotle. The second part or division of metaphysics envisioned as ontology by Ibn Sina, it takes into account the accidents of the existent. Al-awarid, awarid al-mawjud al-ma'lul. Yeah, so the caused existent, I think that Bertolacci likes that, but al mawjud al ma'lul means that it has an illa, which means that it's mumkin al wujud, which means it's contingent. Mm. So, so the first division. <laughs> yeah, kullu ma siwa Allah. So kullu ma siwa Allah is contingent, and so, so uh, uh, the first division of metaphysics as ontology investigates the causes of contingent being. There's another way of saying it, as well as the ultimate causes, the four causes. And the first cause, which is seen by him, which is uh, which is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So the second division takes into account the accidents, uh, the awarad of the mawjud, the, uh, the accidents of the existent. And the third part of division deals with the principles of the particular sciences. Because the particular sciences then are seen as, 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 as ultimately being based on metaphysics. So metaphysics is the underlying infrastructure or underlying skeleton or whatever you want to call it on which uh, uh, every other science is based. And that's set out in these key passages on pages 14 to 15. Um, so let's look at those, that passage, and that would pretty much round out today's class. Um, that is chapter 2 in the Michael Marmura. So it's the second fossil, and it's... So I have to find this passage. Where does he have Asbab al-Qaswa? Okay, so he says, that um uh, uh, ilm, so this this science and yan qasim daruratan ila ajza'in minha ma yabhathu an al-asbab al-qusua fa inna al-asbab li kulli mawjud ma'lul min jihati wujudihi wa yabhathu an al-sabab al-awwal alladhi yafidu anhu كل موجود معلوم بما هو موجود معلول لا بما هو موجود متحرك فقط أو متكمم. We'll just go with the English. This is a very long passage. 
I'll just go with the English. Um, it's a very long passage because it continues from 14 all the way over to page 15. So we'll just summarize. Uh, we'll just um, go through the uh, English translation. In the Michael Marmura edition, this is this is uh, page 11, paragraph 16. What adheres necessarily to this science, therefore, is that it is necessarily divided into parts. So I've already told you that he has a threefold division. Now, this is this is where he actually introduces this. Some of these will investigate the ultimate causes. Al-Asbab al-Quswa, again, these are the four Aristotelian causes or modes of explanation. For these are the causes of every caused existent. Mawjood ma'lul. Contingent being. With respect to its existence. This science will also investigate the first cause, capital F, capital C. Al-Illatul Ula, is that what he says? Mm. Or no, he says he says a sabab al awwal. Sabab illa, they can be used synonymously. From which emanates every caused existent, inasmuch as it is a caused existent. Now notice he uses the word eminent emanates. What's in Arabic? Fuyub. Yeah, he uses the term fayd, but doesn't he? Fayd. Yeah. So he, he upheld the notion of emanation. It's not an accident that Marmur uses the word emanates here. Mm -hmm. no. You have to read carefully. <laughs> emanates every caused existent in as much as it is a caused existent, not only in as much as it is an existent in motion, mm -hmm. only in as much as it is quantified. Some of the parts of this science will investigate the accidental occurrences to the existent, the awarad. Right? The awarad of the mojud. And some will investigate the principles of the particular sciences. Now pay attention to this part. And because the principles of each science that is more particular are things searched after in the higher science, as for example the principles of medicine, he likes that because he was himself a doctor, found in natural science, and of surveying found in geometry. So, atib is seen as being tahta al-ilm al tabi So medicine comes under the category of natural science and its principles ultimately are rooted in natural science okay then he also gives the example of surveying i think it says misaha in arabic yeah yeah misaha he, he, he probably does mean surveying here it's not abstractly cal sitting in your room and calculating the uh, area of a triangle or something but actually figuring out okay how big is this field or how big is you know how big is this lot where we want we want to build uh um we want to build uh, a, a, a new palace for the for the sultan or whatever it is that these guys are trying to do, right? So <clears throat> those principles are ultimately rooted in geometry. So he's saying that there has to be an ultimate ground in which all sciences are rooted. And that, of course, is metaphysics. And so... Um, And so, so yes, yeah, so the principles of particular sciences then ultimately go back to some uh, some uh, more general science and all the way back to the most general science. So he says, and because the principles of each science that is more particular are things searched after in the higher science, as for example, the principles of medicine in natural science and of surveying found in geometry, it will so occur in this science that the principles of the particular sciences that investigate the states of the particular existence are clarified therein. Okay. So he goes on, this science, thus this science investigates the states of the existent and the things that belong to it that are akin to being divisions and species until it arrives at a specialization with which the subject of natural science begins. Relinquishing it, relinqu relinquishing to it this specialty and at a specialization with which the subject matter of mathematics begins relinquishing to it this speciality. And so he goes like this. This then, I've skipped forward to paragraph 18. This then is the science sought after in this art. It is first philosophy. It is first philosophy. Because it is knowledge of the first thing in existence, namely the first cause, and the first thing in generality, namely existence and unity. Al Mojud Wal Al Wujud not Al Wujud Wal Wahda. It is also wisdom. 
وهي أيضا الحكمة التي هي أفضل علم بأفضل معلوم فإنها أفضل علم أي اليقين بأفضل معلوم أي بالله تعالى وبالأسباب من بعده وهو أيضا معرفة الأسباب القصوى للكل وهو أيضا المعرفة بالله وله حد العلم الإلهي الذي هو أنه علم بالأمور المفارقة المفارقة للمادة الحد والوجود and the first thing in generality namely existence and unity it is also wisdom which is the best knowledge of the best thing known for it is the best knowledge that is knowledge that yields certainty of the best thing known that is god exalted be he and the causes after him it is also knowledge of the ultimate causes of the whole of cause things moreover it is knowledge of god and has the definition of divine science which cons consists of a knowledge of the things that are separable from matter in definition and existence so this is where it all sort of comes together. And you see here, this is a kind of reference back to these things in the first maqala, in the first chapter of the first maqala, where he says, you've heard that there is a wisdom which is true wisdom. You've heard that there is a philosophy which is true philosophy. You've heard, you remember those things from the first chapter. So here he's answering that question. And now he has set out what the subject matter of metaphysics is supposed to be. And he has done this very nicely. In so doing, he has reworked materials from Aristotle. He has combined ideas which were which were there before him in the works of people like Al-Kindi and Al-Farabi. And he is highly original in this because the question of the theme of what is known as metaphysics is raised and thoroughly discussed for the very first time in the history of philosophy by Ibn Sina. And it is for this reason that it is the Shifa, that it is for this reason that the Shifa is a milestone of Western metaphysical thought, or of any metaphysical thought for that matter. It's a, but Western in particular, if we take Aristotle, you know, as being a Western philosopher. So that's why the work of Ibn Sina in the Ilahiyat of the Shifa has to be seen as a milestone in the history of, shall we say, metaphysical thought. All right. So that's all I have to present to you today. If you have any questions, we can go with the questions. So we'll just stop the recording there and then we can have our discussion. One question. Wallahu alam. Allahumma salli ala Muhammadin wa ali Muhammad.